Welcome, everybody. I'm Sophie Volk, the Chair of Center for Chinese Studies, and I'm delighted to welcome our three panelists today. William Kirby is T.M. Zhang Professor of China Studies at Harvard University and Spangler Family Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School. He is a Harvard University Distinguished Service Professor and serves as Chairman of the Harvard China Fund, as well as Faculty Chair of the Harvard Center Shanghai. A historian of modern China, Kirby's work examines contemporary China's business, economic, and political development in an international context. Orville Schell is the author Ross Director of the Center on US-China Relations at Asia Society in New York and former Dean at Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism. He worked for the Ford Foundation in Indonesia, covered the war in Indochina as a journalist, and has traveled widely in China since the mid-1970s. Schell is the author of 15 books, 10 of them about China, including My Old Home, a novel of exile. He's written widely for many magazines and newspapers, including the Atlantic Monthly, The New Yorker, and The Los Angeles Times. Shell is a fellow at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute at Columbia University, a senior fellow at the Annenberg School of Communications at USC, and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's also the recipient of many prizes and fellowships, including a Guggenheim Fellowship. And finally, John Pomfret is an award-winning writer and former foreign correspondent and editor at the Washington Post. He's the author of The Beautiful Country and the Middle Kingdom, America and China, 1776 to the Present, Chinese Lessons, Five Classmates in the Story of the New China, and From Warsaw with Love, Polish Spies, the CIA, and the Making of an Unlikely Alliance. Pomfret was awarded the Osborne Elliott Prize for Journalism in Asia by the Asia Society in 2003, and the Shorenstein Award by Harvard and Stanford Universities for his lifetime coverage of Asia. So welcome everybody. So our first speaker is Bill Kirby, right? And then we'll hear from Orville Schell and lastly from John. Thanks. Thank you very much. We're here to talk about the triangular relationship between China, the United States and Taiwan. And I thought I would talk more about and initially about uh, Taiwan, which tends until very recently not to get quite the same level of attention uh, uh, the other is it's a bit of the fulcrum, uh, 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 oftentimes, of uh, U.S.-China uh, relations. And I remember when I was I first went to Taiwan, the same, I think Tom Gold had been there before. We both had Fulbrights uh, in the same year. And I was called in right before going to Taiwan. I was called in by, this, by the director of placement at Harvard, of, of graduate, or undergraduate graduate placement, a guy who's in charge of career services, to meet with him. And I thought, what a nice idea. He knows there are no jobs in China studies. He's trying to get me a good job after I get through this research. And he says, while you're in Taiwan, would you mind doing a little bit of work for a certain agency? Uh, this is at a moment, 1978, when the American troops are going home. And, and I said to him, well, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I wasn't a big fan of the CIA at that point in time in any event. Um, I declined by saying that the last time I looked, Taiwan was an island, and I was not a very good swimmer, and they have a very good police uh, force, and uh, thank you for the opportunity, but I didn't uh, take it. I'm just going to give you a little bit of something that you all in this room probably know reasonably well, but some commentary on the kind of trajectory of Taiwan's modern development, uh, a place, of course, of Aboriginal settlement, uh, settled mostly then thereafter by Chinese from Fujian uh, and other coastal provinces, uh, a place that, of course, becomes under Japanese control uh, in, the, uh, in 1895, having been a province of the Qing only for 10 years uh, before that period of time, uh, a place that becomes industrialized and modernized largely initially under Japanese uh, authority, uh, a place that, the, that builds a beautiful presidential palace uh, although then the Governor General's Palace, uh, uh, still there today uh, serving the ROC, and a place that is welcoming. Here are the elites of Taiwan welcoming the Japanese, and 50 years later, welcoming the nationalists. Uh, a more welcoming people is difficult uh, to imagine. Not always happily uh, received, however, on one side. And of course, it becomes the home of so-called free China, uh, the portraits of Sun Yat-sen, Zhang Jiesh, or Zhang Kai-shek, uh, ubiquitous uh, in the height of the Cold War. Uh, it is an ally of the United States, a 30-year alliance uh, 
or an alliance uh, of 1954 that would be terminated in 1979, a place that looked to be the bastion of national recovery, uh, a place that communicated mostly militarily uh, with the mainland uh, uh, and the great struggles over Jinmen and Matsu that became central to American politics. Uh, some in this room will remember during the Nixon-Kennedy debates of 1960, a place of rather rudimentary forms of communication across the strait uh, in those days, here from Jinmen to Shaman, uh, oops, uh, and other forms of communication. Uh, and a place uh, of Sino-American friendship. One of the, I used to have, uh, when I was, when I used to give examinations to my students, I've decided I don't do that anymore um, bec uh, because there's, it's so disappointing. Uh, but the, uh, I would, uh, one of the IDs I would give was the Sino-American uh, 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 Treaty of, of, I forgot the precise name, uh, of Mutual Defense, Sino-American Mutual Defense Treaty. Uh, which is, of course, that between the United States and the Republic of China. And almost no student can identify that app. Here is President, Vice President Nixon giving John Kaishek what he's always wanted, a picture of President Eisenhower, who then very shortly visits himself, um, and seemingly not particularly pleased in this way. The only time an American president has visited the, the Republic of China uh, on Taiwan. Uh, and it, yet, of course, as we know, uh, presidents went elsewhere after a period of time. Uh, ending the rather special relationship, or it, and as Taiwan is the government, uh, the ROC is the government of all China, uh, beginning the normalization process here in 1972. Uh, sorry, again, go back to that. Um, and each president, I won't show them all, of course, has met with senior Chinese leaders. Here's Zhao Ziyang uh, and uh, President Reagan, uh, and the late Jiang Zemin, uh, very sadly passed away just two days ago uh, with President Clinton. Uh, right up to the current day. So the American side uh, had seemingly sided with one side, leaned to one side, one might say, uh, in, uh, with, uh, while maintaining the autonomy of Taiwan. And yet what has distinguished Taiwan throughout all this period is its own indigenous success here in land reform, a successful land reform, while that on the mainland failed catastrophically. Here, a great leap outward uh, toward an export-oriented uh, economy at a time that the mainland was pursuing a great leap forward, uh, catastrophically. Uh, series of leaders first moving from a kind of a generational uh, and really almost monarchical succession uh, to Zhang Jinglo, uh, to the first Taiwan-born president of the Republic of China, Li Donghui, uh, to Chen Shui-bian, and Having set in store finally the promise of 1927, when the, the when the Republic of China is reestablished as the Kuomintang, to have seven years of tutelage and then democracy, well, they had 70 years of tutelage, times being what they were, uh, and finally a democratic system in which the Kuomintang here can lose power, but then it can regain power uh, as well, uh, uh, and move toward, in a brief period of time under Ma ying toward a normalization without unification. Uh, in, a, in, a, in what seemed just a few years ago to be the direction of the times. Those times didn't continue, as we all know, uh, although the presidential succession, the democratic traditions of Taiwan now seemingly well established with the return of the DPP uh, under President Tsai Ing-wen here, uh, still swearing allegiance uh, to Sun Yat-sen, to the Republic of China, still singing the Guo Ge, uh, which is of course a nationalist hymn. Uh, well, and it's not by accident that President Trump, when he's first president, decides I'm gonna call the president of China and the Rolodex being a little bit off, um, uh, ends up calling Tsai Ing-wen. Um, but, uh, and uh, here's an example, and we can talk about this later, of American, you know, he's, this whole thing is being set up in part by those who want to support Taiwan. The, but this form of support of Taiwan does not automatically, at least in my view, make Taiwan more secure, nor does the visit of uh, this congresswoman, um, uh, in my view, make Taiwan more secure, rather significantly 
uh, less so, but it's Taiwan is in a position probably not to refuse uh, the, the happy, if not if somewhat dangerous embrace of American uh, politicians. But where Taiwan is today is at the fulcrum, not just of US-China relations, uh, the irredentism uh, of Xi Jinping and others to reclaim this last part of the old Qing empire uh, that they yet as yet don't control, although it wasn't part of the Qing when the Qing fell. And one would think that if one really had that as one's mission, one would start with Mongolia. Uh, but uh, Taiwan is also home here. Here's a uh, tying one with Morris Chang, uh, the president, the founder, uh, and uh, 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 no longer president, but retired president of TSMC. Uh, perhaps the, maybe without question, the best technology uh, company in the world. A man of whom I will just anecdotally remind you was a Harvard freshman. Uh, and he wanted to be an English major at Harvard. He loves, still loves English literature. Whenever I meet him, and I've known him now for 30 years, I give him a novel. But when he told his father he wanted to be an English major at Harvard, his father forced him to transfer to MIT to get a real education. Uh, and he, he did, and he's done remarkably well. But Taiwan is now home, of course, to the greatest technology company and the greatest semiconductor uh, company in the world. And will the American embrace of this or the recruitment of TSMC uh, to Arizona in Northern Phoenix here uh, be good or bad? Uh, for the prospects for Taiwan, but either economically or politically. Uh, on that, I have some significant doubts, but we'll leave that for open, uh, for a more open discussion. Uh, we'll just end with this last slide, which should remind us that at the end of the day, Taiwan is physically actually quite closer to mainland China than it is to the United States. And we're at a moment in time when that isn't obvious at least to some members of Congress. I will stop there. Well, uh, that was a nice little uh, sort of reprise of, of uh, you know, Taiwan's history. Um, let me start with Taiwan and then maybe make a few remarks about what's going on in China now and how that's influencing uh, what will happen uh, between us, China, and Taiwan. Um, to, to see these photos, I mean, I first arrived in Taiwan in 1961 uh, as a young student, and I remember going out to um, a beach uh, across the Taiwan Straits at night just to listen to the radio broadcast crackling in from the mainland because it was uh, it was so exciting, and there was a profound sense of something really tectonic and important happening across the Straits. Where at that point. Taiwan was rather sleepy and a kind of a, of a backwater, but an American ally. And, um, but the state of antagonism between Taiwan and China was real. And uh, in those days, I remember also riding my bicycle down to the presidential palace that you saw a, a, a photo of. And at the invitation of the, I think it was the Qingyan Zhou Guotuan, the uh, youth Save the Nation uh, uh, Youth League, uh, I would have tea with Chiang Kai-shek. And uh, there weren't very many foreign students there then. I was back in Taiwan again uh, about a month and a half, two months ago, and it was a rather a, 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 a haunting experience to be back in this uh, island that had, since I had, had been there as a young man had become incredibly successful, very democratic, an extremely well-run place, and yet back in a state of complete antagonism with the mainland after this interim where, as Bill has suggested under President Ma ying there was this, this period of years where it was very hopeful that things could be resolved. And so the question, I think that, uh, everyone uh, is asking is what happened? Why did the whole thing come a cropper? And I think here is where we need to segue off to uh, Xi Jinping and China, because I do think uh, uh, it was the advent of Xi Jinping, 
the notion of China having gained wealth and power uh, and its claim, territorial claim, which is insoluble and, and, and incontrovertible that Taiwan is part of China and China is gonna get Taiwan one way or another, as Xi Jinping said, sooner rather than later. So that transforms everything. And here we are after all of these years, after Nixon and Kissinger and nine US presidential administrations, all supporting engagement, we're back at a state of antagonism. And I will just remind you of how strenuously the United States sought to maintain engagement and to demonstrate to China, even though we had different political systems on and on and on, that uh, it was something that the United States was supporting. After 1989, the Beijing massacre, you will remember that Bush the elder sent his national security advisor, Brent Scowcroft, to China, secretly, did not even tell the American ambassador. Uh, I recently had a look at the transcript of that meeting. It was a stunning evocation of American effort to keep the relationship alive, to keep engagement functional. And Scowcroft kept saying to Deng Xiaoping, President Bush is your friend, let's not break off the relationship. And Deng Xiaoping kept saying to Brent Scowcroft, you did this, you caused this demonstration, you're responsible, and kept eschewing him. And yet, things did go on, engagement did continue. And I think the great tragedy of uh, this new century in which we find ourselves is that engagement has ended irrevocably. And it has profoundly impacted what's gonna happen in Taiwan. And I, I, I think it ended precisely because uh, Xi Jinping had this notion that once China had attained sufficient power, it didn't need to bend to compromise, to engage in diplomacy in any way, it could have its way. And we've seen that again and again and again, whether it's the Sengaku Islands with Japan, the South China Sea, Hong Kong. And this, it seems to me, presents not only the United States and Taiwan, but indeed the whole world with the potential tragedy of monstrous proportions. And the tragedy is this, that China, which when I first visited in 1975, when Mao Zedong was still alive and the Cultural Revolution still was in its waning phases, but still quite alive. Um, you know, uh, uh, since that time, um, we've come a kind of a complete full circle. China that had accomplished such an immense uh, uh, feat of na national development and having catalyzed this country, country that was once the sick man of Asia, remember that, the Yajo the Bing, back into a state where it was a great power. This now is all in balance. This is all threatened. The uh, decoupling with a uh, myriad other problems that China is having, I mean, having alienated countries that were once the most accommodating countries in the world, like Canada, who alienates Canada? Sweden, Norway, Australia, India, the first company, country to recognize China in the 1950s. The tragedy is that China is decoupling itself from the world at the very time that it's reached its apogee of, of attainment. And it has so much to be proud of and so much to be that pe its people should be able to enjoy. Instead, it has thrown it back into a state of antagonism with the world. But of course, above all, the state of tension is greatest with Taiwan. And is the reunification of the motherland worth throwing away a hundred years of 
hard work and development on the China mainland, uh, it seems like a preposterous assessment of national security to say yes to that question. And thus, we see this triangle, which is the subject of why we're here tonight, enmeshed in all kinds of other very complicated uh, considerations. But I think at the heart of all of it lies Xi Jinping and his new notion of what it means for China to have become a great power. And here, I think to, I'll end simply by saying that what I think we see happening now in China, you know, I don't know, I can't predict. We've never predicted anything very well in China, those of us who study China. But when Chezhong Miwash, who taught here at Berkeley and won the Nobel Prize of Literature, he said in his speech, and I, I paraphrase here, he said, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a society that is ruled by silence, a single person speaking the truth sounds like a gunshot. And I think that's what we're experiencing now in China, that a few people pushed to the limit by COVID policies have actually spoken out in ways which everybody thought was unthinkable and impossible. But they have uttered those few words, not a lot of them, but even one person does sound like a gunshot in such a silent room. And that, it seems to me, I don't know where it will lead. Uh, I don't think the Tiananmen Square is gonna fill with protesters when they celebrate or memorialized uh, Jiang Zemin on Tuesday, as they did when they memorialized Hu Yabang in 1989. But it's a reminder that, um, you know, everything is up in the air now. And uh, this will, of course, have a profound impact on what China does in regard to Taiwan. And it would be a great shame, it seems to me, if China uh, were actually to throw away its hundred years of development and the, quote, China miracle, simply to grab Taiwan back into the embrace of the Chinese Communist Party, when that is less than 2% of the people of Taiwan want that fate. So this is a rather dark and gloomy, I suppose, uh, uh, analysis of what's going on, but I think we are at a very stressful and very fraught time. And uh, Taiwan was at the middle of this a week or two ago, it's sort of been pushed to the side, but it will return again, because that is the place, that is Asia's Ukraine. And we all know what happened when Putin went into the Ukraine. Let me stop here. I should have come with a few jokes to lighten up the mood a little bit. But thank you, Orwell and Bill, for, for those really interesting remarks. I wanted to push a little further on, ja, on uh, Xi Jinping. And I'm going to inflict um, a paragraph of a speech he gave in 2013, just a couple of months after he became the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. The interesting thing was this, this speech was released uh, in Shoshu as a magazine of the Central Committee in January of 2019, about around the same time that um, Xi Jinping went to Davos and gave his speech extolling the virtues of globalization. And the Davos speech and this speech are really interesting to compare because it shows you how external facing Chinese uh, officials will say one thing, whereas internally, they often use Chinese as sort of the first layer of encryption. They'll say another thing to their people. And this is um, from one of the first paragraphs of the speech by Xi Jinping. Facts have repeatedly told us that the analysis of the basic contradictions of capitalist society by Marx and Engels is not out of date, nor is the view of historical materialism on the inevitable, inevitable demise of capitalism and the inevitable victory of socialism. This is an irreversible general trend of social and historical development, but the road is tortuous. For quite a long time, for quite a long period of time, socialism at the primary stage, which is China, must still cooperate and struggle with capitalism and its most developed productive forces. 
this idea of struggle runs like a river through most of Xi Jinping's internal speeches. And if you look at what's happening now with, in, with US-China relations, you can kind of put that into context of, of, his, of his worldview. So currently, China is facing significantly high unemployment. Its economy is probably not growing. It's got a serious problem with zero COVID, which it's kind of trying to walk back. It has a population specifically above the age of 80 that doesn't have a very high vaccination rate. It's dealing with a lot of struggle, a lot of problems. And so if looking at US-China relations, you can kind of understand now why the Chinese are being relatively nice to America. There was conversations with Joe Biden, there was a meeting with Joe Biden, et cetera. Obviously, they're in a situation where struggling doesn't make sense at the current moment, but cooperation does because they need the United States. And so as a result, as to your point, several weeks ago, Taiwan was on the front burner. Now suddenly Taiwan is on the back burner. Again, because the Chinese don't really see this as, as, as an appropriate moment to struggle because they need to cooperate, because they need America's support. They want to try to, to the extent that they can, begin to pull away some of the decoupling that's been pushed by the United States. They're, they're playing nice, in, in, in other words. Uh, interesting, uh, I, I think that Orville's point about what's the demonstrations happening in China right now are, are fascinating because to, to uh, you know, sort of requoting Cheswav Miwash, it, it sounds like a thunderclap when people are actually pushing back against, against the PRC, but it's very interesting, the policies that Xi Jinping and his minions have taken in reference to the protest. Again, cooperation and struggle. On one hand, you see, and just in the last couple of days, the significant dismantling of uh, zero COVID policies. In fact, zero COVID has not been mentioned by a senior Chinese official in several days now, except for Zhao Lijian, who kind of made a mistake as, as the foreign uh, affairs spokesman, when for 45 seconds, he literally didn't say anything at the podium until he finally said, oh, we're, we're supporting zero COVID. But for, for the last couple of days now, in several speeches from the National uh, Health Commission, and also from Sun Chunlan, who is the COVID czar, she didn't mention zero COVID. So they've begun to dismantle some of the zero COVID policy. At the same time, they're beginning to crack down. There have been arrests of protesters. The Politics and Law Committee, which is the, 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 the most significant uh, political judicial structure in the parties, have had, had a meeting vowing to crack down against hostile forces, which means sort of Americans and their ideas and Chinese dissidents. Um, the Cyberspace Administration has introduced new rules starting on December 15th that if you like a post that's considered inappropriate, you could suffer the consequences. Cyber, cyberspace authorities have also begin to, begun to squeeze Tencent and other social media platforms to remove posts. And owners of Huawei telephones have started to report that their, their own videos and um, other photographs of demonstrations have begun literally to disappear from their phones. And so cooperation on one side by dismantling some of the architecture of zero COVID versus struggling on the other side by rolling up protesters and squeezing and locking down. I think from, from my perspective, that's, that speech has really been sort of set a great moment of light to me in trying to understand where Xi Jinping is taking his country, not simply in terms of his domestic policy, but also in terms of his policy towards the United States and then to Taiwan. Well, so thank you very much and looking forward to your question. None of us would disagree that this is a really dangerous moment uh, globally, U.S.-China relations, Taiwan in between, Taiwan in between. You know, one of the remarkable things about, uh, uh, you know, I had some friends who were in uh, the neighborhood of Ulubu uh, Chilu, um, watching the sign of their own street being taken away uh, the other day. But to have people say, you know, Gong Cheng Gang Sha Tai, uh, Xi Jinping, Sha Tai. Uh, that was never said on April 5th, 1976, about Mao Zedong. It was then down with Qin Shi Huang. But no one dared say Mao Zedong. Um, 1989, I don't believe anyone called directly for Deng Xiaoping's fault, but I mean. Oh, I think I, I, no, I you think there were a few. Okay, all right. There, there, all right. The broken glass as well. Yeah. Oh, oh, of course, of course, of course. There was that, you're, 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 you're quite right. But it is that that uh, voice in the wilderness that is suddenly heard, and and it is a remarkable moment. And whether, you know, what it does tell you, among everything else, is that the political tinder, just months after, the uh, party congress is very very dry, 
and not just in the general population, I, I would expect. But what question I would have for, for John and to think about it, if do, and both of you have you know, that place this direction of China so directly and firmly on, on the one man, on Xi Jinping. And that may well be true, as, as uh, we have certainly seen the, the possibility of powerful leaders determining the fates of nations, uh, and in China in particular. And you know, one of the things to worry about from building on what, what John was saying about Xi Jinping's belief um, in a Marxist future, uh, there's a line in the, in the uh, uh, some, well, some of the memoranda coming with the 20th Party Congress that Chinese style socialism would lead to a new form of human civilization. It's a remarkable phrase. I haven't heard that since the Cultural Revolution, uh, at least coming directly. But here's the question that I would have, you know, Xi Jinping studied um, chemical engineering at Tsinghua University when there was no chemical engineering um, at Tsinghua University. So he did have a political education by and large, but he almost surely, we are not talking about uh, a man who has spent a lot of time reading Marx. Uh, and Marxism. So how, how, and almost surely he didn't write that speech. Um, how do we determine, in fact, what group of people are determining the ideological direction that is very clearly consistent over the course of his rule and very inconsistent with the, uh, the uh, pronouncements at international gatherings like Davos? Do you have a sense of that, please? Uh, if I did, I probably wouldn't be here. I mean, it's it's a it's a great question, and I don't really have an easy answer to it. I think um, the thing that's to me is it's really extraordinary is how in, in looking at the twentieth Party Congress, how well he dominated that narrative, and how there are no officials in the top leadership that represent any alternative to that view and how he, in public view of everybody, basically defenestrated his predecessor by ushering him literally off the stage of history, um, regardless of what, what was said, et cetera. I mean, just the way it looked. Um, and so um, that's something. And, to your point, yeah, he's probably not a expert in Marxist-Leninist uh, ideology. I think he is an expert in Stalinist ideology, and I think his he has studied Stalin uh, and he he praises Stalin and he and he references Stalin's short course on 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 communism uh, on a regular basis, and I know he studied that, and I think he probably has uh, gained a lot of inspiration from that in terms of the way he he himself functions as a leader in, in, in China. So, but but again, to your point of his his brain trust, I mean, you know, there, I mean, people in his brain trust are in the Politburo, and you know, one of them spent time in the United States and, and all that. Um, but how getting at how their thinking has evolved over the time that they've been interacting with him and in China, I think is a very difficult thing to crack. Yeah. You know, uh, you mentioned, Bill, that, that, that I think we, most of you probably saw this rather extraordinary photo. I think it was in Shanghai of them taking the Urumqi, the Urumqi sign uh, down off the street uh, uh, post. And it, it reminds me of, you know, that it's saying in Chinese that you can take the monk out of the temple, but you can't take the temple out of the monk. You know, that you can get rid of the sign, but you can't get rid of the reason why the sign is important. And it's this kind of curious communist affectation that I think comes right down from Lenin is that you, the surface is, is the most important thing. If you can make it look right. It doesn't matter if it is right. I mean, it's like, uh, uh, you know, Chinese will remember this back in the Cultural Revolution when the delegation from Romania would come to visit your factory. You'd spend a week pulling up the weeds and picking up the trash and making it all look right, you know. And I, I think this is, there, there's something about the formality that Xi Jinping uh, has 
put importance upon, his emphasis on pomp and circumstance and ritual and ceremony uh, that really compromises his ability in the world to get things done. I mean, if there was ever a human being on earth that you could make a deal with, it's back slapping, glad handing, smiling Joe Biden. And Xi Jinping spent a lot of time with him. And yet when you see those two guys together, Xi Jinping is standing there like a statue. And Biden is laughing and, and you know, it, 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 you, you can just see a tremendous loss of opportunity, a, a concern to make things look good, even when they're a mess. I just want to, this, this, this is great. <laughs> Sorry. So um, I just wanted to follow on that, that really good point by Orville, because we've just, just a couple of days ago, Jiang Zemin has died. And if there was ever a guy who was backslapping and jovial and goofy, but also a deal maker, it was Jiang Zemin was that guy. And you see in China, these, uh, these, these sort of economists to his death, um, some of them, which as soon as they came out were censored, including a particularly colorful one from a, Yunnan, a woman in Yunnan, but I won't go into that because the verbiage is too dirty to say. But another person said, look, Jiang Zemin was this, this like, you know, who knew a Chinese leader could be so, and literally they use the English word open, um, and who knew a Chinese leader could be so goofy, but nonetheless so practically kind of successful in doing what he did. And yeah, I mean, Jiang Zemin had these moments where he seemed like the maitre d' at somebody else's wedding, but but nonetheless, he he was he was remarkably successful, and I think people in China, at least some of the sort of I guess more colorful stuff that I've been seeing on WeChat, recognize that and are definitely drawing a comparison between him and this stolid Stalinist they have currently as their general secretary. Let me just embroider Bill, and then I'm passing to you. You know, uh, I uh, I've actually uh, when I went with Bill Clinton to China, and Jiang Zemin was the party general secretary, there was this incredible press conference that I urge you all to look at. I have never seen anything like it in my life in China. We got into the Great Hall of the People, and it was announced to our utter astonishment that the press conference would be broadcast live on radio and television all across China. And those two guys got in there like two old hoofers on a vaudeville stage. And Jiang Zemin was, was, he was like a pig in mud. He was so happy to be bantering with the king of banter, Bill Clinton. And they actually did a hell of a good job together. And it even got to the point they started talking about Tibet. I mean, Jiang Zemin raised the question of Tibet. And he said, you know, when I went to the United States, uh, I saw all these people who were interested in Tibet, you know, and, and Lama Jiao. Uh, Tibetan Buddhism. And he said, what's going on here? And well, then Clinton got off on a tear and started saying that, you know, what a great guy the Dalai Lama was. And he was sure if Jiang Zemin can meet the Dalai Lama, they love each other. Anyway, I just mentioned this because this, the, the comparison to Xi Jinping is so stark. And I think, I don't know what's going to happen, but, you know, uh, I think a lot of people are going to you know, she, uh, uh, Jiang Zemin was no, was no, uh, uh, he wasn't pure as the driven snow. He, he, he went after the fall and going, he could do a lot of other things. But I think people may sort of heap an awful lot of wishful thinking on him now during his memorial. And that's not going to be helpful for, for Xi Jinping. Just to uh, add to the kind of storytelling here, I'm not, the, uh, I met uh, President Jiang twice, first uh, with both uh, in the case, context of Harvard. I, I went with Harvard's president, uh, Neil Rudenstein, in 1997. He was giving the 100th anniversary speech at Beida. And we visited, called on President Jiang in the Zhongnanhai and met him in his office study reception area, which was the same room where Mao Zedong uh, lived and worked and slept uh, with a lot of people. Um, and, um, and the uh, uh, and we had a wonderful conversation, but on virtually every topic. And the question was asked to President John, "What's your?" Because he had a piano there. Of course, he's well known for his interest in music. And what what is your at this time in 1997? What is your favorite tune? And he said, "The theme song from Titanic." 
Uh, and I thought to myself, well, that's interesting because as far as I know, Titanic has not opened yet in China. So he must've seen a pirated version, but I decided not to raise that point. But then the next year he returned the visit to Harvard and of course, lots of demonstrations. Ezra really is the one who shepherded this uh, and uh, it was a very successful visit in, a, in, a, you know, in which we have the system in which the students ask questions and a faculty student group chooses always the toughest possible questions to ask for anybody. And he did a remarkable job in that, in that same way. Let me, and so if one gets to the question, he's somebody that one could imagine, the, the question of how can one negotiate with China that one could imagine negotiating with. Deng Xiaoping was such a person clearly given, uh, and you know, in, in his time and way, uh, at least in the desperate situation China found itself in 1971 and 72, so was Mao Zedong and, and, and Zhou Enlai. But how does one think of the, one of the arsenal, one of the weapons that the United States and China have in recent years not used vis-a-vis -vis each other is that of diplomacy. Um, that is, a, we love to sanction, and we are just great at sanctioning everyone that we can possibly sanction in various parts of the world when things don't look particularly right to members of Congress. Uh, China likes to uh, assume that everything that negative happens is somehow some uh, sinister uh, American plot. But US-China, you, know, you can argue, if you take a PRC point of view, that they have been consistent in their policy toward Taiwan and their one China policy. And what has changed dramatically is Taiwan since 1972, but also American attitudes toward that policy, toward that one China policy. So if one were to assume that if you look at this triangular relationship and what has stabilized it over time, you have at least two diplomatic myths. The myth of the one China policy, that is to say that there is but one China and Taiwan is part of it and we don't take issue, et cetera, if, and we don't, uh, or the 1992 consensus. Um, so this, you know, the first one brought, you know, the last one brought three decades of, or at least two plus decades uh, of normalcy across the Taiwan Strait. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the first one still is important for the maintenance of US-China relations. What would you advise President Biden to have as the next diplomatic myth? How can one come to that deals with Taiwan or Tsai Ing-wen or her successor, who is likely to be a DPP? Uh, there are, these things are much more valuable than and they're, they're often dismissed as, uh, I remember talking a lot, I'll, I'll stop talking in a moment, with Gu Junfu about the negotiation uh, of this with Wang Dao Han. And they, they both knew exactly what they were doing. Uh, and it, uh, one China, different interpretations, as Ma Ying Zhou called it. Is there, is there a diplomatic myth? Let's put it this, maybe this is the simplest way to, that can begin to allow for the renormalization of, of dialogue uh, across the Taiwan Strait. So John? I'm just going to be really brief. I think that there could be, but if the PRC won't talk to the DPP, it's not going to happen. And they've shut them out, and so um, just you know, it's it's not going to it's not going to work until they until they recognize the DPP is the ruling party of well, currently. And who knows what's going to happen in the future because the KMT just did really well in local elections. So you know, they could they could get their favorite char characters back, but un until and unless they do, they they're serious about. You know, talking with whoever is running Taiwan, I think it's going to be impossible. A quick embroidery. Um, Mao Zedong said that Taiwan, we can wait 100 years. Smart. Deng Xiaoping, as he was on his way to America to meet with Jimmy Carter, said the same thing. That seems to me a very smart policy. And a fact, they could simply say, listen, Taiwan is ours, but this isn't the, quite the right time to forge that 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 match. Uh, but we will wait, and 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 you know uh, things will change. But of course, what has changed and made that less likely is with engagement dead. We don't have a converging world of the U.S., China, Taiwan, Japan all coming together 
uh, towards a horizon of, of where things will get less hostile, we have it going in the opposite direction. But it seems to me that that's what I would say if, if I was Xi Jinping, let it go for now. But don't release the claim if you really believe in sovereignty. On the other hand, one can also say, hey, Scotland's about to vote to leave the UK. Quebec does that every other week. Uh, you know, the, the Czechoslovakia split in two. I mean, you know, one of the most august principles of the United Nations is self-determination. Just one quick comment on that. I think just doing the math, uh, so 1972, 100 years from German Mao, so 2072 years, 50 years. That's good enough. I think most people would take 50 years. Uh, 50 years uh, from now. Bad from now. number because of Hong Kong. Uh, okay, all right. But it's uh, just, uh, um, uh, anyway, it's a, it's a period, it's a period of time. Should we, uh, John, you want to comment? I have to just uh, say, say one thing about, um, about the problem with Taiwan is that the problem with Taiwan is Xi Jinping. And, and he has equated the rejuvenation of China with reunification. And I think they're increasingly become synonymous. And if you look at the 20th Party Congress work report, there are, there's a lot more um, content on Taiwan in it than in the one five years ago. And uh, his focus on military modernization, his focus on a military that can fight a war, which makes sense logically, but um, is was within the Chinese context considered a little forward leaning. His continued military pressure on Taiwan, it shows that he believes that a critical part of his legacy as a Chinese leader is the unification or reunification of the country. And I think that's the that's the real game changer that we're facing. Yeah. One comment on that being, you know, my I sense over the years, and particularly talking to people in the foreign ministry, but also senior folks in party, there is a, a sense of that Taiwan is to the Communist Party somewhat like Manchuria was to the Nationalist Party. Manchuria was taken by the Nationalists, and China succeeded in, a, in enacting a non-recognition doctrine, uh, really, uh, which the Americans supported. That no one in the world, or almost no one in the world, for the first nearly the first decade of the existence of Manchukuo. Uh, would recognize it. And in, in fact, the first country in the Americas, the first country outside of Japan to recognize uh, Manchukuo, I don't think anyone in this room can guess it. It's El Salvador, uh, because they just, they just answered the mail and they said, sure, they didn't know, they weren't paying attention. Uh, but it was a, in some sense a remarkably successful policy uh, because the nationalists were preparing to fight a war to regain. Uh, Manchuria on the eve of the what became the second the second world war. So that doctrine is still there in to some degree and might be there under any mainland regime, communist or not. I don't know uh, uh, for that. But there's the other question, and I remember a friend of mine was teaching at Fudan a few years ago, and this was during the struggle, uh, not the struggle, the political struggle over the Jiaoyu Tai, the Jiaoyu Islands with Japan. And one of his young patriotic students, uh, it's an American teacher uh, at Fudan, stands up and says, China should go to war. And the American professor asks, why? And the Chinese student said, we need the practice. Uh, and then the American professor said, what if you lose? And this had never occurred uh, to him. But of course, it's a question that you could ask the Qing in 1894. Uh, or in later times. So the uh, is this, you know, you have this broad truculence without a sense of what actually military, what what, what victory actually would mean. If, if the People's Republic of China is successful, even if it's success, my view, I think it's our collective, if, even if it's successful uh, in militarily taking Taiwan, and it might be in a war that destroys some Chinese cities as well, but even if it does, even if it wins, it loses in almost every possible dimension I can, I can think of. And if that's Xi Jinping's worldview, then we are in deep trouble. Mm -hmm.